there we go. Hi everyone, I am Variety TV editor Michael Schneider. Look at you all coming out tonight to celebrate one of the greatest television shows of all time. Oh, I don't know. We have the creators and some of the stars of the show to chat a little bit about Cheers. So without further ado, let's bring them out right now. Co-creator, director, executive producer, Mr. James Burroughs. Co-creator, writer, executive producer, Les Charles. And also co-creator, writer, executive producer, Glenn Charles. We have national treasure in the house, Ted Danson. Of course, that's Cliff Clavin, the one and only John Ratzenberger. And finally, I think you all know what to do when this gentleman comes up on stage. George Wendt! Rock stars, all rock stars. Now, this is a show that I just mentioned, it holds up incredible. We, I mean, this is a show that ended its run 30 years ago, like I said, it premiered uh, 42 years ago, 41 years ago, and I argue it holds up just as much today as it did back in 1982. I, when, when the three of you sort of look at this and look back at this, and are, are you still amazed now at the resonance that the show still has, this whole new generation of people who are now binging it on Paramount Plus and, and on other streaming services? Uh, what, Jimmy, does that mean to you when you just see this, this fandom still, 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 still introduced to this show and a whole new generation binging this and loving this. What does binging mean? <laughs> <laughs> they are consuming this. So, for, uh, for you or the Charles brothers. Uh, I, um, I'm amazed. Uh, it, was, it was a great run for 11 years and uh, to see people, new people watching it, uh, it's just flattering to me beyond belief. Yeah, we started out as, can you hear me? Yeah. We started out, as many of you probably know, in, in the dumper. Our ratings were so low. All we wanted to do was have an audience for the first five episodes. But we had, the idea of somebody watching it 30 and 40 years later was beyond our wild imaginings. But it's pretty, it's pretty remarkable how it's held up. And we, you know, we're still hearing, uh, Kids are our grandchildren's age coming up and saying how much they like they like Cheers. And <laughs> I mean, Ted, I'm sure people come up to you and ask you about a lot of different projects that you've been involved with over the years. But but I imagine Cheers still comes up quite a bit all these years later. It's fun to walk through an airport and see who approaches you. And it used to be the Cheers fans were getting older and older and older. All of a sudden, I think maybe since, you know, being quarantined, people started watching again. And all of a sudden, people are getting younger and younger coming up and talking about Cheers. And it's really nice to be in front of a group of people that are clearly fans of television. So that's really nice. I knew that was an applause line. I mean, John, same thing. I'm, I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of folks also grew up with you with the Pixar movies, and they're asking you about that, yeah. But in, in addition to, I, I'm sure people ask you for a, a cliffism or, or for trivia or, or something as well. What do you find uh, when- oh, all, all the time, people ask me for little known facts. <laughs> uh, it's a little known fact that you're annoying. <laughs> No, it's actually part of me. I've always been, uh, even as a kid, I'd read everything, encyclopedias. I just love knowledge. So I brought a little bit of that to the character. But the attitude of that, you know, uh, that, come, that comes from a, a father of a buddy of mine who was a cop growing up. And he thought he was Dick Tracy. Uh, but any little infraction on our bicycles, you know, you're supposed to have reflectors on the back of that ratchet burger. 
you know, uh, you know, uh, and he'd cite, you know, uh, the, the laws and stuff. So I just always thought that was funny. So that's why Cliff became who he became. Do you have a go-to fact when people ask you for for trivia or something that you uh, you throw out and, and impress uh, the crowd? No. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wish I did. I wish I, I was that smart, but no. I, I, we'll I write don't. something for you. What? We'll write something for you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Lesson better be working on it. I think maybe they should give you some trivia napkins to pass out or something. So. And, and George, do you, uh, I'm sure to this day, you can't walk into a room or an airport without someone screaming norm to you. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was wild for, for quite a few years. Uh, people, you know, recognize me and acknowledging me. And, you know, I remember one time I was in New York uh, and it was just, you know, you know people are so uh, all around you, you know, they, you couldn't, walk a block. Anyway, a winter time arrived and uh, all of a sudden I'm in a hoodie and like a big scarf and nobody recognized me at all on the street. And it was, this is amazing. This is great. And then I would go into bar X, Y, or Z and, uh, you know, I'd take off my hat and my hood and my scarf and it'd be like that scene in Robin Hood where King Richard the Lionhearted comes in. He'd be like, my liege, <laughs> our king. There it is. <laughs> I have made up for the last few years. <laughs> well, Jimmy Glennon, unless uh, take us back to the, the very beginning. I'm sure there's been quite a legend that has built over the years about the origins of, of Cheers. A lot's been said, a lot's been written. But what, what do people maybe get wrong or, or what do people sort of misremember about the start of Cheers and, and, and sort of where the idea did originally come from? Well, I don't know what popular conception uh people have about the origins, uh, but uh, we had worked on a, a show called Taxi for several years. Uh, thank, you. thank you. And uh, we were offered our own show by the network, and um, we, uh, we loved working on Taxi. We learned a lot from that experience. We wanted to do a workplace show as opposed to uh, a family show, a man, wife, Etc., uh, which, which Taxi was, and we. But one thing we didn't like about Taxi was that it was a bit on the. It was in the garage, a bit on the dingy side. So we wanted to uh, go for a more upbeat place, a place where everybody knows your name, but where you want to be. And um, we we settled on a bar, and uh, which not that not in those days. I think this is still true, but maybe not. Um, the uh, a bar was a very much a social club. Uh, when we first went looking for, for places in Boston, we, we, we knew we wanted to be in Boston. We knew we wanted to be in the East. New York had been used too much. Uh, so we, uh, we settled on Boston um, and just the, the, there's a, it's, it's the city has a character all of its own. And um, when we walked into the, to this uh, bar, bar for the first time called Bowen Finch, which as we've commented would have been a great name for it the show actually. And uh, we, uh, it was, it was an afternoon, mid afternoon. And there was this group of about four or five guys expounding on every subject. You could tell they'd been there for a while. They came there every day, again, mid afternoon. And I thought, this is it. Uh, everything I, li I we liked everything we saw about the place. The, uh, even the step down steps, uh, the stairway, uh, which uh, was a great introduction and an exit for people. Um, but uh, we, we wanted to be in a bar. We wanted to do, uh, we liked the idea of a romance developing. And um, so just uh, one thing led to another. So we found out we got a lot of stories from, uh, from that, uh, that both the, uh, the relationship of uh, Sam and Diane uh, to begin with, and then the, uh, the social club atmosphere, or a gang gathers at a place where uh, 
everybody knows your name. Well, and, yeah, and, and that idea too that the, the door opens and it could be any sort of character who comes in every week and, and sort of, sort of the, the, the comedy then spools out from there. When we were first starting out, we would do some research going to bars. We'd, none of us had ever been in a bar before, so we decided to <laughs> go, go take a look what they're like. But we went to some bar, bars, mostly around L.A., and they're just so full of interesting characters. And I remember the three of us went to a bar one night and overheard a conversation, about four or five people sitting in a bar. And they had this long, prolonged discussion of what was the best canned soup. <laughs> So this, this thing about the sweatiest movie is not, there's not much fiction to it. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, ABC passed on it, but NBC was there. And, and what was sort of that pitch to the network like? Uh, no, ABC didn't pass. We had, uh, the three of us came off taxi, and uh, we had uh, uh, an agent who's so famous, he only has one name, Broder. <laughs> and uh, he said, you guys should... Uh, do your do a show, and uh, so because Taxi uh, had been, uh, uh, you know, we'd worked together on Taxi. NBC made a deal with us to do. We were scheduled to do two pilots. They had to put one on the air, and the first pilot we did was Cheers, and uh, the rest is uh, history. Well, let's talk about the casting, uh, because famously you had three groupings that you looked at. Uh, for Sam and Diane. Um, and, and ultimately, of course, you guys went to the mat for this gentleman over here. So I, that I feel like you... That might be overstating it. I feel like the right decision was made, but uh, yeah. turned I don't, out I don't, okay. We didn't go to the mat. It was apparent. It was apparent from the audition. Uh, Teddy and Shelley auditioned together, and they had... Uh, chemistry, which only makes writing look better, and uh, it was it was an obvious choice. I mean, Sam, uh, when we when we audition when we audition these people, Sam uh, Harrison was not Malone. He was a wide receiver for the Patriots. So uh, when when we cast Teddy, we thought he looked more like a relief pitcher for the Sox. <laughs> uh, Bill Lee was, you know, I, I think the prototype. But the other, the other people, the other guys who read for Sam, one was Fred Dreyer, who looked like a wide receiver for a football team. And the other one was Billy Devane, who was, would have been an older Sam Malone. And, but the obvious choice was, uh, it was apparent to everybody, it was Ted and Shelley. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I we think weren't sure, we weren't sure our, ourselves, actually. We, we did the three couples for the network stage that had a little staging in, in a bar, mini bar. Uh, part of a bar. Um, <laughs> and uh, we weren't quite sure ourselves because all three of those actors and actresses uh, were, were just terrific, excellent. Uh, but boy, when we got Ted and Shelley in front of just a small audience and they started to work off of each other, it was, there was just no question in anybody's mind. It was fabulous. Such chemistry immediately. Yeah, and, and uh, I, I think it was Fred Dreyer and Julia Duffy were, was the pairing. And um, Ted, what do you remember from, I, I, I read somewhere that you were doing all of this actually on the bar set of Bosom Buddies uh, before they had built, That's correct. That's right. wow. before they had built any obvious uh, set for, for Cheers. So research. what do you remember? <laughs> what do you remember about doing this for the first time with Shelley on the set of Bosom Buddies of all things and, and how, Real, you thought this might become for you? You know, Shelley obviously is not here, um, but deserves to have her, you know, just sing her praises because she was. Uh, I, I don't think we'd seen a character like that, you know, since Lucille Ball, and she just really nailed it. And I, I go out of my way to say, I do believe I was on Cheers because I worked well with Shelley, but Shelley was, uh, was just a knockout. Um, what do I remember? Um, I do remember the little teeny bar that had been set up. Um, yeah, I, here's my favorite part. When I, I was doing Taxi with Jimmy, a guest part, and 
They invited me down to their offices. They were just starting to cast Les and Glenn, and I read uh, a couple of times for them. And the second time they said, um, don't, don't take another job without checking with us first. And I went, so, so you're saying I got the part? And they went, no, no, just, <laughs> just uh, check with us first. And then I went out one door and I looked down the hallway and there was every actor in LA coming up the stairs <laughs> to audition. So thank you, Shelley. And again, if you go back and watch that first episode, that pilot episode, the chemistry is undeniable. So it, it clearly from, from the start. Um, John, you originally read for Norm, right? That, that's what you first came in for. Yeah, I just wasn't uh, good looking enough. <laughs> But, but, but then they, they, they needed sort of that, that know-it-all, that, that, that no, I, far I, fly. I, I, I didn't have the advantage of uh, going to an acting school or, I, or maybe I was just dumb enough and just didn't bother. But um, I, I never learned how to audition. Still don't. <laughs> but um, I have a background of just making stuff up, which I, I came to find out it was called improvisation. <laughs> and somebody once said, hey, you can make stuff up good. <laughs> and anyway, I, uh, I just uh, improvised. Or well, I asked the question, do you have a bar know it all? This is as I was walking out the door with my tail between my legs. Because these guys, their eyes are already rolling in the back of their head during the audition, checking her watches, coffee. <laughs> so, you know, my eight by 10 was already going into the wastebasket. <laughs> and I just uh, turned around and said, do you have a bar no at all? And I think it was Glenn. I said, what are you talking about? It's all I needed. And I, I just really wanted to regain my dignity. And uh, <laughs> so I improvised this character. And it, coming from New England, I come from Connecticut. And, and, uh, you know, my dad and relatives frequented different bars. And even as kids, we'd go in, but there was always one horse's patootie in every bar <laughs> that uh, claimed it was the font of all knowledge. So any bar bet would be thrown in front of them saying, what's the answer? Like, I think you guys even used the, uh, what's the length of a whale's intestine? <laughs> and uh, the guys say, baleen or blue? <laughs> <laughs> so I was, you know, as even as a kid, like those characters. So I, I went down that road, and but just really wanted them to laugh enough that I wanted them to know that I knew what I was doing, because I had already worked for years overseas and um, on a chain gang. Uh, <laughs> but no, but anyway. So I left, and two days later, I got the call. So, so he, he, John basically sort of talked himself into a role. He, he, he managed to like sort of talk himself into an iconic role. That's... He's, the, he's the only character, or the only actor on the show who created his role. We, we, uh, we, did, we, did, we did some modifications on it and thought uh, this guy probably should be wearing a uniform. It gives him more of a feeling of importance if he's... We thought maybe a doorman or something, but we settled on it. Well, we, we, we did come up with Postman because uh, we... Postman, it would seem to me, that passes out in magazines, uh, would uh, read a lot of headlines, maybe a couple of paragraphs or something. So many things. In other words, they know a little bit about a lot of things. And, uh, and I think most of, uh, most of uh, Norm's... Uh, excuse me... Uh, uh, Cliff's uh, uh, ex expounding was uh, starts starts with a little it's a little known fact, and uh, that goes on for most of the uh, what, half hour. Now I should I could clarify real quickly that the reason that uh, John was reading for the role of Norm is that we had we wrote that uh, the role of Norm for George with George in mind. One of the two characters that we had actors in mind for well, the other one was Carla because we. Known Rhea for quite a long time and worked with her. But, um, 
But George had was committed to another series. It was just at pilot, pilot level. And if that had gone to series, we'd have lost George. So we had to read some other actors for that part. But thank God uh, the that show didn't go. And <laughs> well, George, George, that's an actor's dream. They, they're looking for a George Went type. Yeah, no, you know, they, it was. I had, I had to look like a guy who wanted another beer. <laughs> and I'm like. That I can do. <laughs> uh, my agent called and said, "Honey, they uh, they want you. You know, uh, come in. Uh, Glenn Charles, Les Charles, Jimmy Burroughs. You you liked those guys. You did Taxi and remember those guys. They they want, want you to come in. It's a small small role though. You know. Uh, so I go, oh okay, cool. That's cool. Uh, how small? She says, well, it's really uh, one line. And uh, you know, come to think of it, it it's one word." Uh, I'll be damned. It's one syllable. And I go, oh, what's that? She said, beer. <laughs> and I was meant to be Shelley's first customer in the tag of the uh, episode uh, where she, she goes, oh, hello, I'm Diane. I'll be your waitress. Well, I'm not really a waitress. And then she goes on to a page and a half of her, her backstory. And, um, and then she goes, oh, I'm sorry. I should probably take your order. What shall I get you? And I said, beer. And, <laughs> and she goes, beer, perfect. And that was, that was the, uh, the tag. And then it, it morphed into uh, my show got uh, canceled and the offer came through. And... Thank yeah. God. And we got the true norm. You know, the other interesting thing, and this may be going a little too into the weeds, but when you watch the pilot, you do notice that there's a character in a wheelchair and it's Elaine Stritch, and originally, right? No, what? it wasn't no. the actress. No, the character, uh, it was not Elaine Stritch. Uh, it was a character called Mrs. Littlefield, who was a Boston Brahmin who came to the bar and, uh, and uh, had an occasional cocktail at the bar. And uh, she, was in the, she was in the show, she had dialogue, but it was just, it didn't meet our standards, so uh, we cut the scene. But she's still in the background. Yeah, yeah. So, so a character that could have been that never quite made the, yeah. the, the grade. Was she named after Warren Littlefield? She was. Uh, one of the NBC junior execs <laughs> <laughs> at the time. He became fancy. Well, you guys mentioned how uh, the first season, it was the lowest rated show on television? Dead, dead last. We were dead last. We were dead last Thanksgiving, you know. I like to say we were 70th out of 69 shows. <laughs> <laughs> so then the summer came and people started catching up on the show and started watching it and, and it started to give it a little bit of life. Uh, talk about that and sort of that, 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 that slow burn, that, that eventually turned it into the hit that it was. Well, these were the <clears throat> days when there were just three networks, three things to choose from. And because our, uh, our, our competition for our first season was a very popular detective of a uh, show called, uh, what was Simon, Simon and Simon. Simon and Simon. And everybody, yeah, it was a number one show. So everybody had pretty much seen Simon and Simon when summer came around. So we were on reruns and people discovered us essentially over the summer. Uh, that uh, made a big, big difference. Didn't have anything else to watch. We changed the name of the show to Cheers and Cheers, right? <laughs> <laughs> was, there, was there a moment when you started to really feel like there, there was traction, that, that you started to notice it showing up in, in the zeitgeist or in popular culture? Uh, yeah, in the summer. When, uh, uh, when uh, Simon Simon was, was, do, or, was doing repeats, and we were doing repeats. So many people had seen Simon and Simon. So they decided to tune into another channel. They saw us. And then in September, we won like six or seven Emmys. So that, that really, that really uh, uh, broke out. Yeah, that was a big turning point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and NBC at that time was, had gone out under the banner of quality television. They made a really big deal of that. So after after they you know, paid so much lip service to us, they couldn't cancel the <laughs> show that had won all the Emmys that year. So we knew it'd survive. You know, a another question that uh, it's it sort of become like a, uh, uh, almost a, 
uh, old folks tale, I don't know if it's true or not, but the, the legend goes that the audience was so wildly loud and, and so excited and laughed so hard that people started to think that it was a laugh track when it wasn't. It was just the audience laughing. And that's what led you to add that tag at the beginning of the episodes, Cheers is taped in front of a live studio audience. So is that, is that accurate? What, what, uh, what sort of led you to do that? It is accurate uh, that uh, we did get uh, a great response. I think it was maybe the setting of the bar that people felt compelled to be loud, open. And, but we did, we did get good audience response, and that made a huge difference. I think especially for the cast, uh, there's nothing quite like working in front of a, a live audience, particularly in a comedy for a cast. I think they will agree with that. And uh, the immediate response really energizes uh, both sides of the equation. So that was, that was important. Um, but I, I don't know. There's something about seeing an audience response predicted to a, ca to a comedy that, uh, made, that it, as I say, energizes. We, uh, we were uh, big fans of M.A.S.H. And that was one of our first uh, jobs on uh, television. And uh, we loved everything about the show, uh, but they, they had a, a very subdued laugh track, but it was, it was not filmed in front of a live audience. So we, I think we decided from that that we would, uh, if we ever got a chance to do our own show, we would want uh, people and, and, their, and an audible reaction to our work. Yeah, we, yeah. Were, we, were all, we were all, all three of us, we met on the Phyllis show. I was the resident director and the boys were the story editors. So that's where we first met. And that was all multi-camera comedies. They had like six or seven going at once. And so, you know, it was just natural for us uh, to, to I'm, a, I'm a theater rat. I was brought up in the theater, in the New York theater. So uh, it's, for me, it's Tuesday night when we shot the show was opening night. And there's not, nothing more thrilling than an opening night. And I can tell you, the amount of shows I've done, I still get nervous. I still, you know, and I'm sure the boys do too. You don't know if your story's gonna work, you don't know if the jokes are gonna work. So that, you know, that, that prolongs your life. That, that, I like to say the spilkies you get before, before, the, before you do the show. Well, Ted, you've been doing mostly uh, single camera comedy in recent years. Do you miss the, the multi-cam form? Uh, is, is it something you would? I don't know if that's a young man's sport or not. You know, that's a lot of adrenaline pumping through your body. Just go, uh, so I don't, you know, I, if, a, if one came along that was amazingly written, I'd probably change my tune. But uh, yeah, it's, it's theater, you know, it's the real deal. Um, sitcom, real deal theater. I guess that doesn't really work, does it? But close. <laughs> But the thing about the audience when you were just talking about, you would rehearse and you'd get it down and it was really good, but it was never anything like what it would be when the audience came in. To the point where uh, some, Jimmy would sometimes not be able to get his cameras where he wanted to get them in, in, during the show in front of the audience. So the audience would leave and then we'd go p do pickups of different things. They, uh, I think, Jimmy, you told me that they rarely used it because the energy level from the actors just dropped mm -hmm. sizably when they, you weren't playing for the audience, with the audience. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a craft, and, and uh, it is interesting that we don't see as many of them as we used to. But, uh, of course, Mr. Burroughs, you're continuing to, to keep that uh, alive to some yeah, degree. It's, uh, I've, I've attended the uh, funeral for the sitcom many times. <laughs> And somehow they spring, it springs out of a coffin, but I'm not, I'm not sure now. I just, I don't know what's going on. I, I, maybe it's the quality or something. You know, back when you had, I like to say, back when you had three networks, you had 30 great comedy writers. Now you have five networks and you have 30 great comedy writers. So, you know, it's just, People are doing it before they're ready to do it. It's just, it's just a whole, uh, uh, it's a whole Michigas now. I don't, I don't understand why there are no, not more sitcoms. Yeah, no, it's it hard. It's, it's hard doing three camera in front of an audience. That's one of the things. It's much easier to do it without an audience, and you say, okay, I think those jokes are funny, and let's <laughs> go with it. 
But an audience, you either make them laugh or you don't. There's no, there's no kidding, kidding around about it. And we didn't, we never sweeten. Well, certain, there were certain cases where we had to. But by and large, that was, that was all the audience, and we lived and died with them. So I can see why people, some people don't want to do it anymore. It's, it's a hard life. Well, let's, let's talk about sort of the longevity of Cheers. And, and part of the longevity, I think, is how expertly you were able to manage change and, and sometimes change that you were faced with, uh, you know, like the, the death of Coach and bringing in Woody, uh, you know, worked. And then again, the transition. Uh, from Shirley to Kirsty, uh, also seemed to be definitely handled. But what can you, what do you remember at that time? I mean, first in bringing in Woody, which again, it's amazing, you were already developing a character named Woody, and then here comes Woody Harrelson, who was perfect for the role. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true. <laughs> we actually, we cast somebody uh, before we, we found Woody. Uh, we were looking for kind of a just an all-American boy, simple from um, a Midwest background, and comes to the big city and goes to work in a bar, and uh, and uh, brings that that just basic simplicity and, and uh, open openness about life. And uh, we pretty much had almost signed this gentleman, and our casting director came in and said, "I know you like uh, I can't remember his name, uh, but." I'd like you to look at somebody, and uh, in walks Woody, and uh, he read, and we had Ted come read with him, and uh, after, I mean, we were, it was like, this, he, he was not right on the money, but he was so interesting, compelling, and funny, and it, uh, Ted, after uh, Woody had left, uh, said, uh, I know you think you got your guy, but there's something I really like about this guy, and I think the, Ted saw it, and we saw it, um, and obviously he's proven himself, certainly beyond cheers, to be a really excellent actor. And uh, but he was perfect for the part, and really filled. Uh, and we, we were very, we were devastated when we lost uh, Nick Colasano. And uh, but uh, the network did. The network stressed. I think he might need to go in a, a little bit younger in the show, and so we we went that way. The way I heard it, he uh, came in and. Uh Blew his nose. Yeah, walking through the door, like into this big audition. He had no clue. <laughs> and uh, he, you know, he, he was, uh, but I saw him the night before at Gelson's, the supermarket in my neighborhood. I, I was in, in uh, you know, produce or something. I'm looking at something, and, and these two young men were like pointing and, Keep pushing each other and laughing, and I, I was sort of used to it. It was year three, and uh, finally the one boy comes over and goes, yeah, my friend said I should say hello to you. Uh, I'm going to audition for the role of the bartender tomorrow. And I, I go, oh, that's great, that's great. Well, look, hey, good luck with that. And uh, I said, what's your name? And he goes, Woody. Oh, no, no, not your name. You know, the bar you know, not the character name, your name. What's your name, Woody? <laughs> I think I might be seeing you tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> but did he not blow his nose? I don't you don't recall that? I thought, I thought he walked in and sneezed, but it, could, oh. he, it, was, it, was, something, it was something we'd never seen in an audition before. So anyway. Either <laughs> way, the guy's a charmer. He just walks in and bang. He's, he's just, you know, he's amazing. We, we were all like 37, roughly, when Woody at age 25, joined us. And we, it was like, oh, let's kick his ass. <laughs> so we, we took him to the basketball court because we fancied ourselves as pretty good basketball players. He killed us. All right, let's arm wrestle. I, seriously, I still have a bad elbow here from, from that moment. I think you okay, went and I, left. I was undefeated leg wrestling champ <laughs> until Woody showed up. So you lay on the ground, you lift your leg up and you hooked it to the back of the ankles and put, he just kept flipping me over. <laughs> then, then we decided, all right, clearly not the physical thing. We'll play chess. Killed us. Killed us. <laughs> Poker, chess, anything. Basketball, yeah. 
Who's bong? <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, uh, other changes, obviously, when Shelley decided to leave. Uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the big mystery is forever what would have happened with Sam and Diane, where the show would have gone uh, had the, the path gone that direction. And it'd be a very different show, right? Uh, so in, in sort of that change, that, that kind of put the show in a new direction. Um, do you say that, Ted, or, uh, you know, it's... It, yeah, I, I mean, first off, she's just... A... Sorry. Weird. <laughs> she's not here. Very strange. Um, you're talking about Kirstie, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, so she came in like a ball of fire. I, I actually, we uh, saw, we were all sitting down to do the table read, and we hadn't met her, or most, some people hadn't met her, and she was making her entrance into the, a little late to the table read. And she put on a Shelley Long blonde wig <laughs> and walked out and was like, okay, <laughs> you'll be, you'll do great. Yeah. And then, uh, and then the, uh, the first shoot night, we, uh, somebody, we're having dinner right before the show, and, and uh, somebody said, oh, geez, we, we should have got her something, right? And uh, yeah, with some flowers or something, what? Oh, geez, what? So uh, Teddy, like, I can't, I got a thing I got to do. And you know, everybody, Rhea, no, I've, I've got to. And so John and I were tasked with um, getting a, a gift for, uh, for Kirsty. So we're literally driving down Melrose in Hollywood, you know, very trendy area and, you know, trashy lingerie, you know. <laughs> No, and, and going past all these places, and we'd go past Big Five Sporting Goods. And John goes, you want to <laughs> buy her a shotgun? <laughs> and uh, like you, I laughed for about five minutes at the thought of it, and then immediately pulled into the Big Five parking lot, and we bought her a freaking shotgun. <laughs> The good news was, John and I were never tasked with the gift department again. Well, I think it was you that wrote on the card, you're going to have to shoot your way out. <laughs> she, she could play woman on the verge of a nervous breakdown better than anyone I've ever seen. She could be tender, crazy, make you cry, and laugh at the same time. She was amazing. Yeah, and, and again, it was that burst of energy that, that really gave the show sort of a, a fresh life and, and fresh direction. Uh, and you know, we saw that throughout the, the, the run of the show when you brought in new characters like, uh, you know, Frasier, obviously. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Which, by the way, we should mention, I mean, the legacy lives on. There's the new Frasier that uh, Mr. Burroughs has directed. <laughs> which will be coming to Paramount Plus uh, at some point later this year. So, so clearly this, uh, this is a creative universe that keeps on keeping on. But uh, nonetheless, bringing in Kelsey Grammer, uh, you know, so, so many others through the years. Uh, but there's another character that we should briefly talk about, and it is that set. It is that bar, uh, which, by the way, is, is actually being auctioned right now. Did, did you, I, I think actually, uh, you guys uh, went down, uh, John and George, uh, and actually visited the, uh, the the old bar set recently. I understand, and and yeah, got to have was, a drink. It was, it was cool to to see it. It's John's scratchings are still in the bar. And... Yeah, I carved my name in the bar the last two days of us shooting the show, but so that was the legitimate bar they're auctioning off because yeah. that's my name was still there. But let's not forget BB Newworth. Wow. Yeah. Baby, baby oh, Miller. Right. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, no, clearly. Uh, and uh, I'm sure there's, who, who else are we forgetting, Ted? I'm, I'm sure there's others, too. But, wow. yeah, we mentioned Rhea briefly, but, of course, Rhea Perlman, one of the OGs. I mean. <laughs> That's my favorite episode. Of, we won't do the whole backstory, but uh, we're, we're Sam and Carla somehow you know, have an amazing evening. They go do this as buddies and friends. And then at the end of the evening, 
there's actually a moment when they're alone in the bar and they kiss. And then they both go, oh, no, 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 <laughs> and, and walk off. But it was, it was one of my favorite episodes. Yeah, it was, it was hard for Shelley that, that week, but <laughs> leave it at that. Yeah, Car Carlos says something like, I'm too much a woman for you, Sam. What did you say? I'm, I'm too much a woman for you, Sam. Yeah. This could never work out. Yes, that was the line. Oh, that's so great. Recently, even rewatching the the finale when when Shelley comes back, uh, when Diane comes back, and and uh, Carla just s screams. She can't stop screaming, <laughs> and everyone has to cover her mouth. It's. So incredible. Back to the set real quick. We're going to take a uh, collection later. It's only $220,000. So I think as a group, maybe we could buy it. Maybe we could keep it on ATX. <laughs> there's, there's actually a number of things that are on sale right now, including a number of wardrobes. Uh, Ted, uh, your Sam Malone uh, Boston Red Sox uh, heavy jacket is $2,500. Uh, John, your Cliff Clavin U.S. Mail Carrier uniform jacket is $2,100. So we have uh, George Went as Norm Tweed Blazer, Dockers, Necktime, and Loafers. You can get that for $420. So there you go. That's <laughs> so we'll take a collection later. Um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the, the end of the show uh, and uh, you know. Again, uh, it was a three-part finale, and uh, it, uh, it's one of those amazing finales that uh, it, to some degree wrapped things up, but in the end, uh, it, it was the bars closed. And we should mention, by the way, who was at that door uh, when, when, when you say, like, sorry, bars close. He's here, I believe. Broder, the agent. Yeah, the agent who started that's it all. Jacob Bow Bow. That's, that's Bob Broder who's at the door. And then the, the door, Sam says, sorry, we're closed. We refer to him as Darth Broder. <laughs> um, He's just too shy and retiring a guy. He's not going to come out. But, uh, Nobody was more brokenhearted to see Cheers and than our agent. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I it bet. Be going, it would be going on today. We, <laughs> we wouldn't be here because we'd be shooting, shooting an episode. Do, do you remember that one of the, the last moments is to pay homage to Nick Colasano, coach? When he died, the cast all went upstairs and got a picture of Geronimo that he had loved in his dressing room, and they put it behind the piano in that area. And the last thing is us, uh, uh, me moving it and straightening it or something. Did you know that on Ted Lasso the other night, they had the same exact photograph in homage. Yeah. George, you know a thing or two about Your that? nephew. He's a good boy. He's my godson. And my nephew. I love the, love the, le the legacy. The legacy lives on. Um, uh, Ted, talk about the decision to, to end the show and uh, when it was time. <laughs> it was John's idea. I had nothing to do with it. Ending the show. Um, hey, in, in my defense, uh, we had all been talking for about a couple of years at least. Is this when? It's the end, right? Is this the last season? And we go, yeah, and then we didn't. Anyway, sorry, it was me. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, the, yeah the I just um, felt, well, never mind. Uh, what do what do you my life was a hot mess is what I'm not saying and uh, I think I needed time to get my life together and I wouldn't have, if I had kept going I wouldn't have met my wife Mary Steenbridge and so yeah. thank you who is also in the house and by the way plug for, for Ted and Mary. They're going to be doing a panel tomorrow here at ATX, so looking forward to that. Yes. Um, that, that, that live Tonight Show uh, farewell, what, I mean, that still goes down at <laughs> the all-time, uh, uh, what happened that night? A lot was down that night. It was painfully obvious what happened that night. <laughs> Nobody 
wanted to say goodbye. Yeah. yeah. But they, they brought a cast of people who had been together for 11 years, who loved each other, hadn't seen each other for two or three months. They brought us to a bar at two o'clock, a real bar, to do press and wait around for Jay Leno. I guess it was live at 11.30, right? And, and well, what the heck? We, we imbibed pretty much everything known to man. So by the time we actually went out, Johnny says he wasn't, but everyone else was hammered. And uh, we, we sat there and Jay was busy because I think he was new to the job. It was his first live thing. And he was taking notes and, and then they go, five, four, three, two, you're on. And he looks up and goes, you can just see his eyes. <laughs> Because our eyes are just spinning, like. <laughs> and it was horrible. We got a lot of flack for it. In hindsight, though, it's one of the greatest moments in late night history. But uh, yeah, at, at the time, <laughs> it was seen as, oh, what's going on here? It, it was like interviewing monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there was no one to go. Poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> he did all right. Well, I have uh, some questions from the audience to share as well that they wrote on, on the way in. Um, a, a couple of uh, quick fun ones. Uh, uh, everyone always wants to know, I'm sure this is the other question you get all the time, especially uh, uh, John and George, is what were you actually drinking? What was in those mugs? Yeah, uh, the boys wanted, uh, Jimmy did not want real beer. He thought the cast might get sluggish. <laughs> um, so it was uh, near beer, and there wasn't a lot of choices in those days. So it was Kingsbury Brew, non-alcoholic near beer, and it came in cans, and they wanted it to be draft, so they had to pour it into a soda pop dispenser well before the cameras were rolling, obviously. Um, and uh, so it was warm and flat, and yeah. And then it didn't look right when it came out because it was so flat, so the, uh, the prop man put a pinch of salt in every mug on the set. Um, so uh, yeah, it was warm, flat, salty near beer. <laughs> And yet, Norm always wanted another. Pardon me? Norm always wanted another. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we were talking about going to market where they just call it warm, flat, and salty. <laughs> so it just didn't resonate with them. No. Not at all. Not at all. Well, here's another question. And maybe Jimmy, because you had to direct these folks, uh, may have an answer too. But uh, was there a moment where you all just broke character and just could not get back together is, is do you remember something that just made you all break uh on set you mean laugh uproariously yeah. uh i'm sure there were a lot of times you know yeah and but... then you just back you back it up and they they say the line again they start backing up and you just gotta you just gotta wait they gotta get it <laughs> they gotta get it out of their system of, you know and let the audience laugh and although the audience would laugh harder when they went up you know, I mean, t Tony Randall, uh, Tony, I did the Tony Randall show back before all of you were born. And uh, Tony Randall was always flub a line in the first scene. So he, he could say to the audience, you can make a mistake on the line, but you can't say shit. <laughs> so they, you know, they would crack up and you just have to wait it out and they, 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 would, they would adjust. Uh, we would taunt each other. We would just, you know, like, oh, what? I'm here for you, buddy. Go, get it, get it. And we'd just stare at him. <laughs> it, it got worse than that. We, you know, we had bar straws all over and little napkins. And during rehearsal, when some, we'd do spitballs. And during rehearsal, someone would have trouble with a speech or a moment or something, and we'd all kind of get a grin on our face and go, <laughs> we'll be there for you. And you could hide behind a pillar and wait for that moment that he was struggling or she was struggling with to go. <clears throat> <laughs> you said you saw, oh yeah, I can still see it on the, when it's on the screen. Well, it's on the reruns, I can still see spitballs flying into the side of Woody, Woody's head. And Woody's trying to do this soliloquy, and he's going like this. And I, I hit the floor. And it was funny. It was uh, my finest. Uh, my finest moment was. Uh, re I remember getting Ted 
right on the uvula. <laughs> His mouth was open and a ding, and it just. It became a sport. All right, Woody's not here, so we can rag on him. Woody was a vegetarian, which meant he had horrible gas, just horrible gas. <laughs> and he, he would come up to me sometimes during a rehearsal or something and say, hey, I, I really, I need your advice. I, I respect you so much. And he'd start this, and he'd be looking me right in the eye, waiting for his fart to reach my nose. He, like a killer, he wanted to see my eyes go nuts. Come on, jump on Woody. And uh, then Any one time, Woody being a vegetarian was a... Uh, sorry? I don't... Wood was a vegetarian, as we all know, and uh, he, uh, we were, somebody catered uh, Chinese food, and Woody found out that after about 20 minutes that he was eating pork. <laughs> and um, so uh, he goes, I don't, I don't know, what do I do? And, and um, he decided he had to go purge. And uh, so I said, out of solidarity, I will purge with you. <laughs> And then Teddy goes, I'll, I'm there too. And there were, there were three stalls in the stage 25 men's room. And uh, you, I will tell you this, you don't want to laugh while puking. <laughs> it just... <laughs> I couldn't believe when you started that story. <laughs> That actually was the day we lost Johnny. You were like, that is disgusting. <laughs> yeah, you were, not, you were not amused, if I remember so. Rightfully so. You weren't amused by us going and throwing up with Woody. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't even remember that. It's good. It's good you don't. Well, I think that was worth just the price of admission to ATX right there. <laughs> You don't want to laugh while puking. I want a t-shirt, uh, I want uh, merch, just like everyone go, go to it. Um, I hope this audience is going to be able to watch Cheers in the future and not think. <laughs> in, our defense, in our defense, you guys were paying us a lot of money to be idiots. <laughs> so Speaking, speaking of the set, uh, I have another question on, did, did anyone take anything from the set uh, as a souvenir? Uh, so you're not, no, nothing? That, that's why it's all on auction now. You, you missed out. <laughs> Should have brought home the, the, the bar while you had the chance. <laughs> it's tough to put a bar in your car. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> um, I guess uh, it's, a number of people are asking for personal favorite episodes. So maybe we could real quick get everyone sort of, I mean, I know it's hard to pick uh, they're all your babies, et cetera. But do you have moments or memories of certain episodes that really stand out to you? Uh, Ted, for example, what, uh, what, what kind of still stands out to you when you think, but look back at, at the whole work? Um, I, uh, wow, that's tough. Um, I love uh, Coach's Daughter because you got to see Cheers do a really beautiful, loving emotion and be funny, you know, at the same time. But as far as a physical bit, which I'm sure like all of the great physical bits on Cheers came from Jimmy Burroughs, there's a moment when Sam thinks that he is going to finally bed uh, Rebecca Howe, Kirstie, and she goes in to change and he... He's up by the fireplace and he starts to unbuckle his pants, but his pants are stuck and he gets frantic and he reaches for a fire poker. And sticks it in. <laughs> I just love that desperation in Sam Malone. How about you, John? Oh, or me? George. Or George. Uh, no, I, Whoever wants I, to no, go no, this, this is a whole other subject. I was out there on the moon. But <laughs> the. The the, uh, the quality of the show, as you know, it stands up to them, but it, it, it's, um, it celebrates the writers, because the writers, uh, and I, I think this goes for all shows back then, were literate. 
they, because a few young writers out there, I know, but they had grown up reading books. True. I mean, that's, you know, when you're a kid, you're reading books, Joseph Conrad, Hemingway, whatever. And they brought that to their art, which was us, you know, putting words in our mouth. And that's, I, I find that sorely missing today, uh, watching TV. But I only get one channel anyway. Um, <laughs> and anyway, also, I just, I just wanted to mention that, that's all. No, also, also stay off his lawn. <laughs> With that damn dog of yours. How about you, George? Do you have a favorite moment as Norm or, or just in general? Uh, you know, <laughs> they're always woody jokes. I don't know why. Um, uh, I just went on about uh, Woody and the jumping jerks uh, when we all chickened out from jumping out of an airplane. But uh, another time there was a Bar Wars episode where uh, Woody has apparently been kidnapped. Where's Woody? What is and then what you see through that beautiful set by Richard Silbert, uh, you know, uh, the, the window uh, where the stairs are, you see Woody being lowered down by his feet like Houdini, and he's all bound and gagged with gaffer's tape, and, um, and, and he's swinging there like, ooh, ooh, ooh. and we go, oh my God, it's Woody, and we run, we go, are you okay, are you okay? Ooh, ooh, ooh. And uh, he's trying to tell us something. Ooh, well, you can't understand him, he's got tape on his mouth. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Well, uh, rip, don't rip the tape off my mouth. <laughs> And uh, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll come back now to, uh, the, of course, uh, Charles Burroughs Charles. Uh, and as we have to unfortunately start to wrap this, this panel, uh, I, I sort of want to leave the, the, the words to you now. When, do, you, do you ever go back and watch uh, old episodes of Cheers? Do you go back to the beginning? Do you, sort of, uh, you, know, do you, do you have now a takeaway of the legacy of the show? And what stands out in your minds about just your, your favorite sort of memories of just what Cheers meant and what it continues to mean. Uh, I, I've got, I have four daughters and uh, they all watched, they were too young when Cheers was on the air to understand it, but I've gone to, the, they have grandchildren uh, now and I've gone to their houses and they'll always want to watch a Cheers episode. They're, they're, you know, it's, it's, I cry all the time when, you know, sitting there with my daughter and uh, uh, seeing, uh, seeing their reaction. And, uh, you know, they've, they've, uh, here, they've binged the show. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm just, you know, uh, I'm just so proud of uh, what that show was and proud of working with these two guys who were gracious enough you know, to give me created by credit. And uh, I, I will always cherish it. Of all the shows I've ever done, and I have done a lot. <laughs> uh, I've done a lot of television. <laughs> I don't know. This, will, this will always be my fifth child. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's just as, uh, I, uh, you know, it's just in the television vernacular now. Yeah. And, uh, I said when we won, well, I think our last Emmy, that we were venerable, and I, I totally, totally believe that. Absolutely. Uh, I, I would like to think that Cheers had a positive influence on television comedy. I think there, there I can see some influence over the years in a lot of shows. Uh, certainly seen a lot of will-they-won't-they romances. That seems to yeah. be required on TV shows yep. now. And uh, I guess we have that to answer for. <laughs> but uh, I agree with Jimmy. I think the, we've spent the day together, the six of us, and uh, brought back so many memories of just uh, working with this group and uh, several of them who aren't here. And uh, I realized today just how important it was to me and, uh, and how much I, I love all of them. and. Uh, Love the memories.
I certainly second that uh, love. And um, I, we watched the first episode tonight. Uh, we've seen it obviously before. And I was amazed that while it's the first episode, it does not look like a first episode. It looks like the people in the bar have been there, have been friends forever, except for the, uh, the new person that comes into the place. And that begins uh, Shelley's story, Diane's story. But I think, uh, I think I'm going to sound really corny here. I think uh, there's a lot of love uh, evident in the show that people, that the actors love for their craft. We loved writing it. I mean, it wasn't just, it wasn't work. We've, we've had shows that were work. Uh, but uh, there's something, I don't know, without the chemistry, we were very, very fortunate to get the people we got to appear in the show, to work with us. Uh, from Jimmy, uh, the, our fellow writers that we had and had the pleasure of working with, to people that would come in and do punch up uh, after a run through. Uh, those were great moments, too. A lot of good moments, and uh, you take that with you. And it's all been uh, revived uh, over the last couple few days uh, by being with uh, these guys and uh, ladies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Well, Two takeaways from tonight. A, don't laugh while vomiting. But B, you all need to do another Cheers binge right now. I think we're all going to go home tonight and do that. Um, again, Glenn, Les, Jimmy, Ted, John, George, you're the best. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.